You don't want to have a sleeve all jacked up. You want a sleeve looking nice and uniform, a little bit like a banana. Just all the way, same shape, all the way down. Uh Hi, I'm Dr. Doug Fung, world's number one weight loss surgeon, author of 13 books, working on my own TV show. Tonight, we're going to talk about the top five gastric sleeve myths. In a separate video, I talked about the top five gastric bypass myths, and I didn't want the sleevers to feel, feel left out. I'll be picking on you tonight. So what we're going to talk about is the top five gastric sleeves myth, and we're going to count backwards. Count backwards, okay? So let's get started. Number five. Can't have the sleeve if you have heartburn slash GERD. Have you been told that? Have you heard that that? You can't have the sleeve if you have heartburn or GERD. That is a, come on y'all, myth. You can totally, you can totally have a sleeve if you have heartburn or GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease, right? Now, most surgeons are saying if you have heartburn, they're going to try to encourage you to go to the bypass. And why is this? Well, some studies do show a higher incidence of uh, heartburn in sleeve patients. But think about this. If you've been doing gastric bypass for a long, long time, right? And suddenly there's this new kid on the block the gastric sleeve and everybody loves the gastric sleeve and everybody comes in wanting to do the gastric sleeve and so you start learning how to do the gastric sleeve but you're not as comfortable with the gastric sleeve even though it's a simpler surgery but you know you're taking you know you're just comfortable with the bypass so along comes the study that says well you know sleeve patients might have a higher incidence of heartburn they might have you know uh, reflux blah 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 and so now you kind of if you're a surgeon you're like oh that's a reason not to get to sleeve because I've known it. You know, I can't be wrong. All these years of doing a bypass, it's still got to be the best. It's still got to be the gold standard, which we said in the other video, that's a myth too. It's not the gold standard. So this has a lot to do with surgeon comfort. Now, if there's a surgeon watching this or a doctor or whatever, they say, no, no, I've seen the surgeries. The surgeries definitely show that uh, sleeve patients have a higher inc incidence of heartburn. Uh, yeah, but here's my rebuttal. Number one, bypass patients get heartburn. Did y'all know that? That was last week. They get heartburn, right? So just because you get a bypass does not guarantee that you won't have heartburn. That's number one. And number two, right, that's number one. Number two rebuttal, I would say, is this. I think this is mostly behavioral. Now, I'm not picking on anybody. I'm not saying it's your fault. But just imagine. Imagine you, get, you go to the car dealership and you buy a car and you're driving off in your new Chevy Malibu or Cadillac or Toyota Camry or whatever, and you didn't have a driver's license, no one had ever taught you how to drive, and you wreck it. <laughs> and you get out and, you know, the, 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 the car salesman says, of course you wrecked it. That Camry's no good. You should have gotten the Lexus. <laughs> but they never taught you how to drive. You see what I'm saying? My point is this. If patients have a lot of heartburn out after the sleeve, it's because we are not teaching them the right things to do. We're not teaching y'all how to eat slowly. I've got lots of videos teaching y'all how to slow down your eating, what foods you can eat, how you progress your diet. You know, we still have programs that tell patients to blenderize their steak so they can get protein in. How fucked up is that? Think about that for a second. If you want to screw up somebody in the head, an obesity patient in the head, who used to love to eat their food, tell them to blenderize their steak. <laughs> that will jack up their head. You understand what I'm saying? So I think we have a behavior issue. issue. So if anyone who has a sleeve, or a bypass for that matter, that has terrible heartburn, 
go watch my heartburn video, okay? It's um, the easiest way to get it. You can find it on YouTube at www.hurtburn. <laughs> you like that? Hurtburn.com. Because it hurts. Hurtburn.com. And you'll see my heartburn video that tells you what to do. You need to eat slower and, and smaller bites, blah, blah. But then it says, cut out your coffee, cut out your alcohol. People complain of heartburn all the time and are drinking two or three cups of coffee and burning their sleeves. Does that make sense what I'm saying? They're eating too much, so that feeling of fullness is starting to stretch out the top part of their sleeve, and it feels like burn. It feels like heartburn, but it's not. It's behavioral. Now, of course, having said that, you do need to go check with your bariatric surgeon, get a barium swallow, and make sure everything looks okay with your sleeve. And I've talked about that before, too. Um, so this is a total myth. It's not a having heartburn is not a contraindication for getting a sleep. So you can really still have a sleep. Even a hiatal hernia, even with a hiatal hernia. No, no, Dr. Vong, I have a hiatal hernia. My surgeon told me I need a bypass. Not true. Not true. You can still have problems with a bypass. You can still have heartburn after a bypass. Just remember that. You can always start with a sleep. And here's my point of this, right? You can always start with a sleeve and move to a bypass if it doesn't work five years later, 10 years later. I know it's another surgery. I know it's frustrating. But if you start with a bypass and you have problems or it doesn't work, you're kind of screwed. There really is no other revision. There's not much you can do, not for weight loss. So it's really devastating psychologically, right? Um, so that's myth number five countdown number five all right how is that boom myth number four is gonna get you too what do you guys think i'm gonna say sleeve surgery is a simple surgery that is a gosh darn see i'm getting better gosh darn myth i almost said fucking myth <laughs> Nope, it's a gosh darn myth. Sleeve surgery is a simple surgery. Well, you know, hold on just again. Yes, that's true. It's simpler. It's and by that I mean easier to do than gastric bypass. It's usually faster, less complicated. Every study has shown that the sleeve is lower in risk than the bypass. Bypass is a good surgery, don't get me wrong. But this is a myth, and I'm going to explain to you why here in a second. So with the sleeve, there are certain nuances. It has multiple little steps in the sleeve, where as the surgeon, I had to be really careful about how I performed it, um, how the sleeve is shaped. Like So you don't want to have a sleeve all jacked up. You want a sleeve looking nice and uniform, a little bit like a banana. Just all the way, same shape, all the way down. Oh, I'll give you an example. Since y'all liked the anatomy part so much, I'm going to draw it again for you. You guys want to do, you want me to do the anatomy of the sleeve again? Yes? Yes? All right. Okay, so here we go. Okay, this is the lesser curve. Okay, right here. This is the diaphragm. Not birth control. That's what moves your lungs up and down. This part of the uh, stomach's called a lesser curve. This part, if there's a lesser curve, there must be a greater curve. And together, this produces your what? Stomach, right? At the bottom, there's a muscle. Who knows the name of that muscle? Who knows the name of this muscle? It's called the pylorus. And that's the valve that opens and closes to let food out in and out of your stomach and let bile acids up, it, it's a kind of a grinding action. Okay, and this appears your esophagus, and it comes down, and the part where your esophagus turns into your stomach is called the GJ, oh, gastroesophageal junction, G-E-J, the gastroesophageal junction, okay? Now, there's a big sheet of fat that goes all around that hangs down and covers your intestines, and that is called the omentum. Okay? Now, 
there's a big old organ right here. It's called your liver. And another organ not as big over here called your spleen. Okay. Now these come into play. One of the things you have to do for your pre-op diet, I do a pre-op liquid liquid diet. I did Optifast, but your, your surgeon will put you on something. That is it's desi designed to what? Shrink your liver to get it out of the way because your liver actually goes woo, way over here, man. It can. And I've seen livers go all the way over here and all the way down here. You can have such a fatty liver. It covers all this area. Now listen, if you don't do your pre-op diet, and it doesn't matter if you have a sleeve or a bypass, and your surgeon gets in there and your liver is this big covering up all the stomach and stuff, what do you think is going to happen? I'll tell you what, the arrogant surgeon will keep going with his surgery. This skinny Asian cancels your surgery. And I've only had that happen to me two times because that person didn't stick to the pre-op liquid diet. Okay, but anyway, so the liquid diet will be really good shrinking that liver back so you can see all your anatomy. And that's the same for both the bypass and the sleeve, okay? Now, the first thing I have to do is disconnect the omentum. It's just gonna be disconnected. Then, I have a special stapler that fires six rows, <laughs> six rows of staples, and cuts in the middle. And I start stapling right here, and I go up to the G junction like that, and six rows of staples, right? So there's three rows, cuts in the middle. So three rows stay on the sleeve side, and three rows stay on the specimen side. Now, why do I call this the specimen? Anyone know? Why do I call this a specimen? That's right. I take it out. It's gone. No moss. Dr. Vaughn, what do you do with my stomach? What do you do with my specimen when you take it out? Well, you know, I take it home. I make purses out of them. I sell them online at Etsy. I bedazzle the shit out of them. <laughs> I'm just kidding, man. Uh, we send that part to pathology to look at. I can't take home your stomach. I'm just kidding. All right. So now this part is gone. No moss. That's, that means no more. That means gone. And you're left with a tube of stomach that is shaped like the sleeve of my jacket. And that's why it's called the sleeve. That's it. You don't put in a sleeve. There's no device. It's just a nice long sleeve. And you want to leave a little bit of the bottom part of the stomach here called the antrum to help you grind the digestive food, okay? Now you want it nice and uniform. You see how I drew this nice and uniform? Now why am I drawing you? Oh, because I know somebody's gonna ask. Dr. Vong, what happens to the mentum? It's just hanging down here. Well, in my clinic, we call the sleeve baby. So it's a baby sleeve. It can be a baby bypass too, right? So baby sleeve because it's new, I just made it. You gave birth to it, you've been excited to have it, you did all this insurance work, pre-op work, and now you delivered the baby, a baby sleeve, okay? So people go, Dr. Vaughn, what happens to the momentum? Well, your body is so freaking smart. Your body is so smart, check this out. Your momentum will find its way back up and it will migrate back up and reconnect itself to that staple line. I know, that's crazy. It will reconnect itself to that staple line. Why? Because it's a raw edge. It's trying to protect, protect that staple line from leaking, right? So guess what your momentum is now? Your baby blanket. Ta-da! <laughs> so your, your momentum is now your baby blanket over your baby. baby. Isn't that cool? All right, that's awesome. Okay. Oh, <laughs> why am I talking about this? All right, so there are nuances to forming a sleeve. Yes, that is technically much easier than a bypass because there's no anastomosis, but you want to make sure it's nice and uniform. You don't want to get too close to this bend here in the lesser curve uh, called the incisura because that's how you can end up stretching your sleeve. I'll talk about that later here. And you want to make sure the staple line is nice and straight that's not wavy. I've seen sleeves that are all wavy. You can twist the sleeve. The sleeve can get all twisted. You can leave too much stomach up here at the top called the fundus. You can leave too much stomach at the top and that part is more likely to stretch out. You can be too close 
to the uh, pylorus and then that those sleep patients might get dumping because there's no stomach reservoir down here to churn and digest the food and I've seen this happen not to me but heard about it through the grapevine because this surgeon worked in the hospital, same hospital I did one surgeon completely disconnected the stomach he didn't know what he was doing totally lost and disconnected the stomach cut it in half and he didn't know how to do a bypass so then they had to call a bypass surgeon luckily I was out of town so they called a different bypass surgeon who had to come in and turn this into a bypass so that patient did fine but she woke up with a bypass so kind of scary so there are nuances to the sleeve now if your surgeons or your program is trying to talk down the sleeve like oh it's simple surgery you'll recover you you know I've had patients who have only been off of work three days dude don't do that I have an entire um, perioperative course that talks about what to expect while you're in the hospital what to prepare what to bring to the hospital what um, you can expect the first month I tell my patients to take as much time off from work as possible I, I mean like if it's four weeks six weeks just take as much time as off as possible because you never know how it's going to turn out you usually feel tired the first uh, first month or two and also you just don't know what the heck you're doing with this sleeve you don't know how to eat it's embarrassing co-workers are staring at you so the best thing to do is just stay home walk walk and breathe walk and breathe all right so sleeve surgery is simpler than the bypass but it has very technical nuances that your surgeon needs to understand I hope that was helpful top five myths number three this one is going to blow your mind and I'm gonna keep it short too because it'll cause a lot of problems. Sleeve surgery removes the hunger hormone. What do you guys think? Fact? Holy shit, Dr. V, that's a myth too? Yup, sure is a myth. So, but that, but that's the whole thing. They talked about, you know, the sleeve removes the hunger hormone. You're removing 75% of my stomach, right? 75% is gone. But guess what? All right? You have these ghrelin. The big one, with everyone says ghrelin, G-H-R-E-L-I-N. That's the, the hunger hormone. Problem is what? There's hunger, there's ghrelin all over your stomach. So you still have these, a lot of it's down here in the antrum, in this part of the stomach, but they have it all over. And remember, your body is super smart. I mean, your omentum knows how to reattach itself to your stomach. Okay, that's number one. Like, doesn't remove it all, does not. remove it all so your hunger hormone your ghrelin level they tested it will drop down very low but not to zero and then if you follow it out long enough it starts to come back up okay so it might remove the hunger hormone but just temporarily and number two and this is the more important is that it's a very redundant system so we started talking about ghrelin around 2005 as being the hunger hormone because we were like, yes, we found it. And it made a big splash, found its way onto the internet, into the bariatric circles. Now, fast forward 2020, we've got probably around 25 to 30 hormones now that function in satiety. So some of them make you more hungry, some of them stop, like ghrelin mm -hmm. makes you more hungry. Uh, leptin is another big one. Leptin is probably gonna be bigger than ghrelin. There are, just like in a car, there's gas pedal, gas pedal, and a brake pedal. In our body, in our hormone system, um, there are hormones that make us hungry and other hormones that tell us when we're full. But check this shit out. A lot of them are made in our stomach. Yes. A lot of them are made, produced in, so I'll put a plus. So hormones are made in your stomach. Yes, plus, plus, plus. Hormones, but... There are hormones made in your small intestine. Yeah, all your GI tract has hormones. You actually even have hormones in your mouth, right? 
start as early as your mouth, but where are most of these hormones? <laughs> where are most of these hormones? That's right, your brain. So most of them act on the brain. The end organ is always the brain. It's the brain that tells you what to do. The end organ is the brain. So if you're having weight loss surgery, which is more important? Following your surgeon's plan to the T or fucking getting your brain straight, watching Dr. V videos, working on the hard stuff, right? The end organ is the brain. Someone put that in the comment section. End organ. The end organ is the brain. That means where does the hormone take its effect? Most of them are in the brain. Even if it affects the stomach, there will be another hormone that's released that will then go to the brain. It all eventually goes to the brain. I promise you. Okay? Woo! Man, I bet you that's going to cause some controversy. Now, if that shit blew your brain, you got to share this video into your secret Facebook groups because those people are in there all lost, wandering. And somebody was messaging me today that she already got kicked out from a Facebook group because of sharing my videos and sharing uh, the fact that I'm coming to Phoenix and all this sort of stuff, you know? Good for you. And I told her, good for you, man. That means you're doing something right. If you're upsetting or offending the other person because you're trying to share good information, that means they are so they are so ingrained in what they believe. They just cannot admit that they're wrong. Right? Dr. Vong, you're such a proponent for the sleeve. No, 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 no. No, not true. I did primarily sleeves because, you know, very safe surgery, very effective. But what I found was that when I combined the sleeve plus all of the education and the support and the training, my patients had like a phenomenal result and a phenomenal safety record. Four, four and a half years, almost 1,200 cases, and I never took anybody back for surgery for a surgical complication. Come on now. So that's the education. Your surgeon's probably a fine surgeon. I'm just saying it's the education, right? So. It's the brain part. The brain is the end organ. All right, number two, myth. What do you guys think I'm gonna say? Number two, myth. Sleeve is not good if you have a lot of weight to lose. That you need a bypass. Answer, you got it, myth, not true. I've operated on patients who started my clinic. So we had in my clinic, before I got there, we had our max BMI in my clinic. You know, some, some clinics don't have a max BMI. So shows like my 600 pound life, Dr. Nazarden will operate on any weight. He doesn't really care. But in my clinic, the max BMI was 60. But I had patients show up with BMIs as high as uh, 92 was my highest BMI. And so we put them on a program to get them down to 60. We actually have a um, uh, 13 people. I lost count after 13. 13 people in what I call the Century Club. Now, there are some people, some programs that do a century club for people who lose 100 pounds. All right. So these are people who lost 100 pounds. Oh, Dr. Vong, I've lost 100 pounds. Don't wrong. These are people. My century club is lost 100 pounds before surgery. What? Yep. They lost 100 pounds before surgery, 100 pounds or more. My biggest loser lost 165 pounds before surgery. See, so it's possible. How do you do that? Follow the Dr. V diet. Just ate everything, gave up all the junk, got committed to the program, did what he was supposed to do, showed up on the day of surgery, down 165 pounds. Crazy. See, it's possible. Now, the question you're asking me is like, well, why do they have to have weight loss surgery? Well, they're still more obese. I mean, their BMI was still 60, 55, 50, 45, 40. I mean, they are still qualified for weight loss surgery. They just had so much to lose. But let me tell you what. If they dropped that much before surgery, guess what? What was their post-operative course like? 
man, they kept churning, kept going. And I'm on their asses, you know. I was telling them, keep going, keep going. You still have a lot of weight to lose. And then I tell them, man, you're going to have loose skin. Start saving money. You want plastics in surgery, right? Like, uh, your loose skin is a badge of honor. Embrace it. Start saving it. See, it's very different from other programs where the other programs are all like, no, no, losing weight's hard on your own. You need to have a duodenal switch or you need to have a gastric bypass. And that's just not true. It's just not true, right? It's a big myth. Now, I will tell you, mentally, it's much harder. You know, in America, in Western society, it is easy to put on 30 or 40 pounds. Easy. But to get to be 150, 200 pounds overweight, which is, you know, BMI of 60, takes a lot of dysfunction. Now, I love y'all. I love all my patients who got to that weight. And I'm not making fun of anybody. And I'm not fat shaming anybody. I think y'all know my heart. But it takes a lot. You went through a lot of shit. I get it. Trauma, abuse, neglect, gave up on yourself, stress eating, lost a kid, lost a mom, lost a child. I mean, I've heard it all, right? Homeless. I mean, I just, I've heard every possible story. And I feel for you. I feel bad for you. But that's my point. It's a huge dysfunction. It's a, you need a lot of work. And maybe that's why some surgeons will say, well, you know, statistically speaking, the bypass has better weight loss, which I showed you. It doesn't. Last In the other video, it, it doesn't. Well, then you really need a DS. Well, if you do a DS, and, and we all agree the DS has the highest percentage of weight loss, but you're dropping someone so fast from a high weight, they mentally don't have time to, to just get their heads around all the hard stuff. Does that make sense? So it's really the hard work, right? But it's totally possible. So I'm telling you this because if you're a super big patient, say your BMI is 60 and your surgeon's pushing you towards a DS or towards a bypass, but you've been following Dr. V and you're like, you know, Dr. V's right. This is a lifelong struggle. I don't want to burn any bridges. I want to start with a sleeve, get my head straight, get my finances straight, get my relationship straight, and see how I do. And I'm committed, and I'm going to lose a lot of weight before surgery. I'm going to lose 100 pounds before surgery, and then I'll have my sleeve, and I'll lose another 100 pounds, and I'll see where I am after that. You know, that makes total sense to me, and I think that's a much better plan. So don't give up hopes if you're super big. I'm here for you. Cool. Recap. Number five myth. Uh, you can't uh, have sleeve surgery if you have heartburn. That's a myth. Uh, number four, that sleeve is a simple, easy surgery. Fast in and out. Not true. Don't let them talk you into that. Number three, sleeve removes a hunger hormone. <laughs> not true. It only removes one of the multiple hunger hormones. Okay. And number two, um, you can't have a sleeve if you have a lot of weight to lose. Also not true. It just depends on how dedicated you are. So the number one sleeve myth. Who's ready for it? Number one gastric sleeve myth is this. Sleeve surgery is not reversible. I had this argument just recently with surgeons online. <clears throat> this is, in my opinion, a myth. Sleeve surgery is absolutely reversible. Dr. Vong, what are you talking about? I'll draw the diagram one more time for y'all. Oh, man, tell you what, there we go. So, all right, I'm gonna remove this. Dr. Vong, you removed this part, it's gone. 75% of my stomach has been removed. Of course, of course it's it's not reversible. You can't put my stomach back in, Dr. V. This is the same argument I had with the other surgeons. Uh, and, they, and they said exactly the same thing. They said, you know, I sent that stomach to pathology. I took it out. That, I can't put it back in. Of course it's not. Re your sleeve is not reversible. Okay. Well, here's my counter to that. Don't you know or heard of or seen gastric sleeve patients who four, five, six years out can eat a normal amount of food. Like they'll say, uh, I have like sleeve patients on Facebook will post. I have to stop myself at two slices of pizza. 
And I don't even eat two slices of pizza. I have to stop myself at two slices of pizza, but I know I could eat one more if I really wanted to. And they're sleeve patients. And then they'll say, why is that, Dr. V? How can I eat two slices of pizza? What? And I go, baby, you're asking the wrong question. What is the question they should be asking? That's right. Why are you even eating pizza? Why are you even testing? Why are you even like proud or surprised by the fact that you can eat two slices of pizza? Let me explain that to you here. So a lot of people think that when there's weight regain, that the whole sleeve stretches. But that's not what happens. Most of the time, what stretches is the top part of the sleeve. So this ends up stretching out. And I've seen pictures of sleeves and barium swallows. It looks like almost near normal capacity. So yes, maybe you still can't eat a whole pizza like you used to could do. But if you're a little 50 year old woman and you can eat two slices of pizza, you don't need that much food, yo. We are so confused in the head about how much food we're supposed to eat, okay? So near normal capacity now, because the top part has stretched, okay? So one, near normal capacity, which then often, because of poor education, lack of behavior, leads to weight regain. And number three, if your weight comes back, what will happen to your medical illnesses? Medical illnesses return. Now, it doesn't take a genius, but if I was supposed to, if I told my 13 year old daughter, soon to be 13 year old daughter, that a person could eat almost the same amount of food as before surgery. They regained a lot, if not all of their weight, and maybe even more of their weight, because there are patients like that, and all their medical issues have come back. She would look at me and go, well, daddy, she totally what? Reversed her sleeve surgery. Ah! Guys, the gastric sleeve is completely reversible. It is, don't believe these people. I know they take out 75% of your stomach, but your body is super, super smart. Put that in the comment section. My body is super, super smart. If you keep pushing it and pushing it and pushing it, you will create a whole new stomach again. You will stretch that girl out. Yeah. You did not take care of your sleeve, baby, and now it's a teenager and it's acting up. And it's not because she turned into a teenager. It's because of all of those years when she was a baby and we didn't take care of her. We didn't give her the right foods. We didn't pay attention to her. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't try to read to her, study, read parenting books. And then the next thing we know, they're 13 and they're talking back to you. They're telling you, girl, I want pizza. I want this, I want that. And now everybody's like, Dr. Vong, how do I handle my head hunger? How do I handle my cravings? What do I do about this? Dude, you should have done the work five years ago. Sleeve surgery is completely reversible. My plea to you is this. Please do not waste this opportunity. Please do not waste this opportunity. Yes, maybe you have not hit your goal. Maybe you only lost a hundred, only a hundred pounds. Only, I lost only 80 pounds with my sleeve and I still have 40 more to go. Dude, you're an average sleever. Those are the average results. Now it's up to you to do the hard work, to do the rest of the hard work. What if you had lost those extra, those 40 pounds ahead of surgery? Now you'd be at goal weight. You see what I'm saying? What if you had done that hard work before the baby was born? Every time when you know you're pregnant, what do you do? You like prepare a room, you buy all these baby clothes, you buy diapers, you buy a cute crib, a Moses basket, you um, 
you child-proof lock the cabinets, the doors. You start reading mommy books and what to expect your first year, you know, first year, and and blah blah blah. And and uh, you start watching videos. You start watching Super Nanny. You're doing all this preparation. But when you do a sleeve or you do, you decide to have a weight loss surgery, most people will do the minimum required. And I've already told you, what if our minimum requirements are bullshit? What if they're not good enough? What if they will not get you there? What if we have misinformation? What if we're telling you guys to eat the wrong things? What if we're not offering you enough psychological support, emotional support? What if you have no support after surgery? Well, if it's my program's fault, Dr. Vong, they didn't have a support group, or they had a shitty support group, or they had a bitchy support group. Well, go form your own. Go seek out information. Go become part of my community. Go watch all. I have 400 free YouTube videos. You know, binge watch my YouTube videos, right? Start your own support group. Kick out all the negative people. Just get rid of them all. This is your life. Take control of it. We need to get together as a community. Remember, Dr. V is not a person. I'm a community. And we need to change the conversation in weight loss surgery community because we are hurting people. And it's my goal to end all of that suffering. I'm Dr. Duck Vum, world's number one weight loss surgeon, author of 13 books, and I am going to cure obesity with your help. Hi, Dr. Vong here. If you loved that video, I hope you will check out Velocity2020.com. I want to meet you in person. This is my big annual conference in Vegas. It's amazing. It's not just about weight loss surgery, but it's about taking your life up to the next level. You're going to meet the best people, the best speakers, the best audience possible. You're going to really take your life up to the next level. 2020 is all about vision, clarity, and focus. We're going to show you how to find your vision, what you really want to do with your life, get crystal clear, clarity, and then find your laser focus to do what you need to do to have the amazing life that you deserve. Hope to see you there.